Good afternoon, this, ladies and gentlemen. This is Robert Rayburn here at Life Pro Asset Management. It is July 29th of 2022, last business day of the month here in July. And fortunately, we've continued to see the pivot, uh, not just by the Federal Reserve and its fight against inflation and its resolution to kill inflation before it becomes entrenched, but we've continued to see a pivot in the markets, whether we're talking stocks, bonds, credit spreads, interest rates. Across the board, mid-June has continued to be, at least up until this point, a clear pivot relative to what we saw for the first, I call it five and a half months of the year, which were certainly painful. So this week, what we're going to do is we're going to go through what the Federal Reserve did this week. And whether or not it is a continuation of that resolution that we saw back in June against inflation, and in particular, what it means for your portfolio, what it means for stocks, what it means for bonds, and what it means for portfolio construction between now and the end of the year. Uh, second, we're going to see how this compares to Volcker's war on inflation back in the early 80s. And then lastly, what are some of the short-term trading risks that remain out there? Because there's no such thing as a 100% answer when it comes to the stock market saying, hey, we're 100% certain the market's going up or down. There is always the chance that you're wrong. And so we want to go through what are some of the signs that we still need to see some improvement before we can become even more confident that our second half market call proves to be the correct one. Now, as it relates to the Fed, so I think a lot of people are probably scratching their heads as outside observers. They saw a negative GDP print. They saw a 75 basis point rate hike into a weakening economy. And certainly the logic would say, well, markets go down if something like that were to happen. But for us, we've wanted to see GDP weaken throughout the year. You know, that was our base call back in January was that the economy would weaken and slow to close to zero to 1% growth. And we would see the Federal Reserve respond by pivoting away from a hawkish stance to something that's more data dependent. That got delayed by the war. The inflation cycle got delayed by three or four months or pushed longer by three or four months because of the war. But we think that cycle is starting to play out. So the Federal Reserve wanted to make sure this week that it was not a one-off resolution against inflation in June that they reaffirmed to investors. They take inflation seriously. Certainly, we saw those June numbers were not good as it relates to inflation. So no real optical reason to take their foot off the gas. So they increased by another 75 basis points. But weirdly enough, strangely enough, as the Federal Reserve hikes rates on the short end, that actually has the perverse effect of bringing rates down on the long end, because on the long end of the curve, so your 10-year, your 30-year interest rates are impacted by three factors, only one of which is the Federal Reserve. The second is anticipated growth, and number three is anticipated inflation. So two of those three have started to come down, which is why you've seen the 10-year interest rate come down as a result of that. We also saw continued balance sheet reduction by the Fed, but most importantly was that pivot toward data dependency. So over the last few months, the Fed said, hey, no matter what's going on with the economy, we're going to hike rates to get inflation under control. Now the Fed has said, listen, we've done a lot. Monetary policy acts with a leg. Let's wait and see what happens. And that's really what the market wanted to hear because the market doesn't want them to tighten into a deep recession. And we've seen the results of that pivot. So, you know, the message by the Fed to get tough on inflation started on June 15th. And I remember that because I was out of town and I'm looking at my phone, I'm looking at my computer, and I'm saying, how are the markets going to react to this? Because they're going doubling down against inflation here. And really what's happened since then is we saw a peak in interest rates, a peak in credit spreads, or otherwise known as implied credit risk, and a bottoming out in risk assets, whether we're talking the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, tech stocks, software stocks, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, across the board, risk assets started the bottom. We saw interest rates come down. 
as the market started to anticipate that this was probably peak inflation in mid-June. And of course, commodity prices have collapsed since then as well, even though we've seen a, a bounce here in oil over the last few days. So how does this compare to Volcker and his famous war on inflation back in the early 80s? We know that inflation was spiraling out of control in the late 70s and early 80s. And the market started to sniff out that Volcker was different than his predecessor and that he was going to crack down on inflation. The market sold off in reaction to that. And we saw a shallow recession in reaction to that. Markets sold off about 27%. I believe this time around, we were around 23 to 24%, 30% on the NASDAQ. Um, so very similar price action as it relates to that downside. And then inflation showed signs of peaking and Volcker shifted stance. He became more data dependent. And that's about when the S&P 500 bottomed. So down 27% in total on that big Volcker pivot. And we think this is pretty similar uh, in many respects. Now, there is room for improvement, and that should really be noted. Uh, we still haven't seen that panic buying that we like to see on big up days. So uh, on a typical big up day near the bottom of the market, you might have anywhere from 50 to 60 to 70% plus of stocks on the NYSE, the New York Stock Exchange, that trade with a large two sigma daily move. In other words, if we look at the price action of any individual stock going throughout history, are those big up days representing what we call a two standard deviation move to the upside? So if on average they trade half a percent up or down, are they trading up three, four percent on that day? Um, that would represent a two sigma move. So we want to see more and more stocks in those big up days trade with what we call panic buying, those two daily sigma, those, those two sigma moves on daily price action. Number two, we want to see the percentage of stocks that are trading above the 50-day moving average above 90%. Very, very important. Why? Because throughout history, what we see is that when the percentage of stocks that are trading above the 50-day moving average hit that 90% threshold, it tends to give an all-clear signal that it's not just a short cover rally, but that it is a rally with more durability. And if we go back to why that is, it quite clearly means that those long only buyers are coming in to push more and more stocks above that clear hurdle of the 50 day moving average. So that's something we want to see. We want to see more long only money come in to really give a vote of confidence. And we think that would represent some element of a bearish capitulation in the overall market. Now, in terms of inflation, a quick update here, you know, in March, everything was going the opposite way, right? Uh, commodities were spiking, inflation swaps were spiking, uh, in expect, uh, inflation expectations were going through the roof. And then we saw it in the hard data as well, CPI, PCE, PPI, all those things were ramping up. Now, what we saw in June, which is really why the market started to sniff out an inflation peak, is that the leading factors such as commodities and wages and things like that started to peak out and come down. Those inflation swaps started to come down as a result. And then this month, we can add the third factor, which are the Fed surveys, the expectation surveys, and those expectations are starting to roll over as well. So three of the four factors have turned south as it relates to the leading, uh, leading indicators for inflation. So that's something we want to see. And then lastly, cooling demand. Cooling demand is important. Hard to raise prices when demand starts to tail off. So that other factor, oh, you saw it in those negative GDP prints, is going to, we think, help bring down overall inflation. We see it in gasoline prices. Gasoline prices have come down quite a bit. Now, not enough for myself or anyone here living in California. We always have, it seems to, it seem to have the most expensive in the country. That said, we've gone from about 502, 503 a gallon, all the way down to 425 a gallon. So a very significant drop in gasoline prices. We've even seen a pretty big drop in mortgage rates. So mortgage rates spiked and peaked just over 6% about a month ago in June. We've now seen those come back down to 5.4%. Mortgage rates operate with a lag. So 
I think it's a given where rates are today, it's not unreasonable to think that these could come down even further. So what does this mean for a factor matrix? Moderating growth, inflation coming down, falling interest rates. We think there will continue to be this shift away from value stocks and toward growth. It's going to come in ebbs and flows, right? So for most of this week, growth has outperformed value. Here on Friday, we're seeing a little bit of a breather in those growth stocks. Uh, not an extreme one, just a breather. Um, but we expect those, we expect that uh, shift to come in ebbs and flows. Um, what we don't necessarily see is a real recession marked by deep job losses uh, that would cause us to go to cash uh, and bonds. Uh, and so right now, we think we're in this top right quadrant here, not in the bottom quadrants. That's kind of where we want to uh, leave our stake in the ground for the time being. And so the bottom line here is that the Fed has applied that tough medicine. It started really a little bit before June, but in June, it really got going. A second dose of tough medicine here in July to give the markets confidence that the Fed has restored its credibility. Monetary policy acts with a leg. So now we want to wait and see how all those rate increases feed through to the economy and feed through into inflation. Now, we have work to do. We want to see more urgency on those updates. We want to see 90% of stocks above that 50-day moving average. But with all that said, the stock market continues to appear to be climbing up that wall of worry. So that's what we have for you, ladies and gentlemen, this week. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out to their advisor. You can reach out to our home office here at LifePro at 888-543-3776. And until next week, have a great weekend. Have a great week next week. And we'll speak again soon.